Well, in this exhibition, we've exhibited about 200 books out of Fisher Library's rare books collection of 200,000. It was arranged for an international meeting about the history of anaesthesia in Sydney, and it, we had as collaborators the Australian Society of Anaesthetists, and they have lent us some equipment as well to show alongside the books of the, uh, of the famous authors. We chose, of course, some of our treasures, like this book here. This is William Harvey's book about the circulation of the blood. It's only a, a very modest sized book for one that's so famous, and it was printed uh, during Harvey's lifetime, and uh, it contains not only the original text, but also Harvey's answers to criticisms. So the circulation of the blood is pretty fundamental to everything people do in anaesthesia, so this is really an iconic book. Well, although this is a medical meeting, we thought it was important to think about the patients and how people in general have reacted to pain and tried to combat it over the centuries. So we began with the ancient world, and we have two very interesting books to show. One from the Stoic philosopher Seneca, who thought pain was very good for you and character building, and the other from Galen, his almost contemporary physician from Rome, who even thought the pain of gladiators being treated for surgery needed relief. From the ancient world until the 19th century, very little changed. And uh, we have one book here that's a 19th century textbook of surgery. It's famous because it was written by the man who gave the first ether anaesthetic for uh, surgery in England. And it contains a rather chilling section on how you needed two strong and steady men to hold your patient down uh, if you're going to do an operation. Well, over the ages, people have sought to relieve their pain, both physical pain and mental anguish, uh, with what uh, drugs they could find. The most famous from antiquity to the present day are morphine or opium and alcohol. So in these two cases, we've included books, uh, medical books about uh, opium, uh, like this 17th century uh, book, which promotes it as a cure-all for everything. Uh, diarrhoea, pain, impotence, uh, depression. And but also we've included some uh, literary works. The most famous uh, written, it said, under the influence of morphine is Kubla Khan, uh, Coleridge's poem. But we also have the Confessions of an English Opium Eater, which caused an absolute sensation when it was first published. Until about 150 years ago, Virtually every medicine we had was derived from plants, very few from animals and minerals. And the books that describe these uh, are wonderful examples of how people began to systematise science. So they're f interesting both as uh, medical books and as records of uh, how people wrote and printed. And of course they speak to us in more than one way. Uh, this little book up here is uh, one of the very first books printed in England with typeface made in England. And you can see that it's rather copying the style of the medieval manuscripts. When we come down to the next shelf, we have a herbal that is a catalogue of plants and it's illustrated with woodblock. And you can see when you look at that picture that it really resembles the medieval manuscript picture of mandraga or mandrake, which was one of the few uh, effective drugs to kill pain. These were working handbooks and the owners prized them very much. And this is a nice example where we have the uh, annotations by the owner, uh, both on loose leaf and through the margins of the book. This kind of herbal lists the plants in alphabetical order and it wasn't until the Linnaean classification of plants was invented that we had what we call a mon-botanical classification. This produced some beautiful herbals too, uh, but, uh, and this is a fine example. Well, in the wake of Columbus, many new plants were introduced to Europe from the New World, notably the potato and tomato, and especially tobacco. Uh, Francis Drake, who was one of the earliest explorers, uh, was of course famous for introducing tobacco, which was promoted as a great cure-all. But uh, much more important uh, for medicine, was the introduction of, of two drugs, curare, or the arrow poison, and cocaine. Now, curare uh, was, of course, a mystery 
uh, to the first explorers who were intrigued by the, uh, the blowpipes. The Indians didn't want to tell them the story, but eventually uh, an English naturalist managed to uh, obtain some. When, when he went back to England, he tried it out on one of his donkeys in his country home, found it, paralyzed the donkey, but he kept the animal al alive uh, by artificial respiration, and it survived. So this stimulated uh, the scientists of the late 19th century, and in particular Claude Bernard, whose little book we have here, uh, to work out not only uh, how Curare react, but also in the process to understand how nerves transmit impulses to muscles. So Curare has been very important. Cocaine's not such a happy story. It was, of course, used by the Indians to endure the hardships of the silver mines. And they kept their secrets and shrouded its use in mythology. Europeans regarded it with great suspicion. But when they did try it, they discovered its stimulant properties, and it was introduced into Europe, where it was made into cordials and wines and tonics. During the Enlightenment, scientists started to think of the body in terms of its mechanical properties, and they, it was a short jump to think of the body as a machine. This book is the most famous uh, philosophical exposition of that idea, and it got the author into a lot of trouble. But the idea caught on, and the idea that you would be able to substitute for failing organs and, uh, was implanted in people's minds. And indeed, anaesthesia was the very first example where that became practical. The next cabinet is devoted to uh, chemical ex uh, work on gases. And that was where anaesthetic gases came from. But the question of how to administer them depended on having some apparatus. And we uh, have here a very nice example of an early inhaler, which was a device to allow you to inhale the anaesthetic, but also enough oxygen to keep you alive. These have been some of the highlights of the exhibition. There are many more books to see, and they have been scanned, and you will find them in the virtual exhibition on the University Library website.